Hello everybody, in my last video I looked into the Atari ST and what it meant for music production back in the end of the 80s and the 90s. And I got tons of comments from you, thanks so much for that and keep it coming. Also lots of corrections and things I should also look into, so there's tons of more ideas for new videos. But in that video, first I want to do some corrections and while doing some more research into looking for corrections, I found some more obscure Atari ST models, which we will also have a look at in this video. But after that, we will go to the main topic topic which is look a bit at the company Steinberg which provided some important sequences on Atari ST namely the Pro 24 software as well as Cubase so the first incarnation of Cubase showed up on Atari ST and we'll do some really hands-on with those tools and try to record a little bit of music with that as well and finally end the video with trying to understand all the versions of Cubase audio on the Atari ST. So let's dive right in. So first thing, check Tram Yell. I did not want to imply that he only was an employee of Commodore. No, he was the co-founder. But as I already said in the last video, I did not want to go into this whole story of Commodore and Atari, which is very interesting. And it takes some hours to explain all these things and the fights between the two companies. And there are many videos on YouTube, watch them, they are really interesting. So, Atari ST model. So I said something wrong about the 260 ST because I said it was a stripped down version from the 520, which is not the case. They quickly understood that it was underpowered what they intended it. So it had actually the same specs as the 520. And the only difference was that it was sold separately without the floppy disk and without the monitor and quickly together with also the 520 ST plus was released and the plus somehow intended it was not really a redesign or anything so it just got soldered on the half megabyte another half megabyte so we had the full megabyte and maybe that was the idea for the plus and uh, what i could also find was here a little bit of price list so for a full system with a 520 ST plus and the floppy and the mouse and the monitors all the things you need you had to pay about 3000 Deutschmark back then and I put that into an inflation calculator now and this would mean nowadays if you would buy in 2024 such a system you would pay over 3000 euros so their slogan was power without the price so you can imagine how much more expensive all the other computers were at the time and for a student as I was at the time it was really really hard to afford such a computer Next correction, I talked about their first attempt to create a tablet computer, which was fully correct what I said, but a wrong picture slipped into my presentation. So this Atari touch tablet is really only a touch tablet for drawing. And this was a system which was sold to be used in combination with the old Atari, so the 8-bit Atari has nothing to do with the tablet prototype they built later on. Then there was a whole topic with this 4160 ST, which was never really released, and I called it a prototype. And then <laughs> I got corrected. This is not a prototype. It was produced in a small amount of units and sold to developers. And looking into that, I found out, okay, there's some discussions about that, if you're allowed to call it a prototype or not. So... Interesting what people could discuss about, but nevertheless, I found out more things. So looking at the manual for it, it was interesting that you find in the appendix of the manual mentioned also a 2080 ST as well. And um, this was the same thing basically. And on the Atari Museum.info site, which is, which is a German site about Atari computers and all the models, you find the info that this was never sold as well and here you see also the mentioning that it was only for developers but it turns out there were also things prototype marketing prototype sent out to people as well so also some models of that thing exists which you can see here in a 
picture. So the correct wording, I guess now is not product and is not prototype. It's actually a marketing sample. But the story is even more complex. There was a another 2080 model which was really sold by a company called Mladinska Knika. I guess I butchered that name <laughs> sorry for that which was set up in the former Yugoslavia and this license from Atari and this had this blue sticker on it so this model was a simple rebatching of a 1040 ST which was up to 2 megabyte of RAM and as you see here on the list uh, of the Atari Museum, there was also a 1040 STE Plus intended, which should come with a PC emulator built in, but also this model was never released and I couldn't find any further info about this. So if you know anything more, just tell me down in the comments. But moving on to one model I totally overlooked was the Mega STE, which is an STE inside of a TTO 30 case with an SCSI port option and it had a 16 MHz CPU instead of the 8 MHz in the normal models and faster serial ports. This model is also very interesting if you plan to run Cubase audio because it has this SCSI port. But besides the official Atari models, there were also lots of mods. So you could get, for example, tower cases, but there were also some solutions for industrial applications, for example, from the German company IBP Gerätebau GmbH. They had an 190 ST, which was set up in this casing. And I think it's interesting to note that they also kept the MIDI port on here. But it's also interesting to note that the MIDI bus was also used for net network applications so <laughs> even it was very slow it was used for these things if you maybe remember the midi maze game so this could also be a reason to keep that interface here and they even had a, a mobile model which was called the msp 190 but it looks quite heavy to me but nevertheless it was mobile yeah, and after all this research, I was really thinking hard if I should get one. And the most interesting uh, device is clearly the Falcon. But I checked secondhand prices and these things are sold for gold. It's unbelievable. So 3000 euro for an old Falcon 030 is insane. And also the more common models are quite expensive. And nowadays, I remember some years ago, you could get that for 50 euro maybe, but nowadays it's more like 500. So I will stick clearly with emulators, which is totally fine for the task of doing a bit of history research with that. And also another tip I wanted to give you, if you want to read up about this old stuff, there is a site called homecomputerworld.com and it houses a lot of these old magazines. They're all in German, so you need to be able to read German, but nevertheless, all those PDFs are there. And I'm currently making my way through the 68,000 <laughs> uh, which was later called the ST Magazine. And this is also very interesting to read and you find lots of interesting reports in these magazines. But let's switch to the main topic of today, which is the company Steinberg and the software they developed for the Atari ST. And in the picture, you already see their founders, which is Carl, better known as Charlie Steinberg, and his partner Manfred Rürup, which founded together the company in 1984. And they started their work on a Commodore 64. And Charlie Steinberg developed his first sequencer, which was called Multi Track Recorder for the Commodore 664. But it was soon followed by the Pro 16, so a 16 track MIDI sequencer which you can see here in the picture and it was looks yeah, very old school but the real story begins when Werner Gracht joined Steinberg actually he never did really join it he was always working as a freelancer for the company and since Charlie was still busy uh, developing and maintaining the Pro 16 he could directly jump into developing the Pro 
24 version on Atari ST and the Pro 24, as the name implies, had now 24 channels. And afterwards, he also started to work on Cubase. So he's actually the father of Cubase. And I need to point out, he has a very interesting homepage, which is in German, but you can easily translate it. And I guess you know how to do this nowadays. And there is one page which is very interesting to read about his time working for Steinberg and what happened with the Pinnacle takeover and the next takeover of Yamaha. So who clearly check that out and it's also linked down in the comments. Yeah, but back to Pro 24, which was the first big thing for the company and had a nice marketing in the UK, which also shows Mark Kelly from Marillion, which I'm a big fan of, especially also of Mark. So nice to see. Yeah, and when it was released with a dongle copy protection, so this was now the way forward and all the company had to do that because, as I already mentioned last video, piracy was a big issue and the company somehow needed to protect their software or otherwise uh, they would simply be bankrupt, which happened to some of them as well. Uh, the price was, I could find it in pounds, so it was £250. And again, I threw it into the inflation calculator and this turns out to be 750 pound nowadays, which relates to 870 euro or 950 dollar, which is quite a lot of money for such a nowadays, if you look at it, a simple sequencer. And it retains the pattern based format and each track can be up to 999 bars long, which relates somehow to 30 minutes worth of music if you do it with 4.4 4 and 120 BPM. Yeah, but let's have a look ourselves. Yeah, let's fire up Pro 24, which I have here in version 2.1. And yeah, you basically see the concept already on top. You have 24 channels now and you see they are all record enabled, but you can only record one track at a time by selecting this little arrow. So pretty simple concept. And on each track, you can have several patterns and then you can arrange these patterns into a song. So pretty simple concept and I connected my Roland GV1080 to that, which I will explain in more detail when we look in Cubase. So basically you can configure in Atari what MIDI input and outputs to use and then you can simply use it. So if I select the first one, I configure this to play the drums and you see that here with the MIDI channel. So MIDI drums are always on channel 10. So I said the first track should send to MIDI channel 1 and then the second second track should send to MIDI channel 1, which contains a bass, and I think this might be an origin or something, so we can check that out in a second. And the beep for a click is pretty annoying, so you can also say you want to have a MIDI click instead, and in the definitions you can say which channel this MIDI click goes to, so this goes also to the drum channel and then sends also a kind of snare sound which I selected here and it took me a bit to find out how I could actually hear the keyboard so you need to enable your MIDI through to on to hear the sounds while you're recording. So let's do that. I set the left and right locator so it's looping in that area. Let's go to record. Okay, something like that. So the beep jumped in as well. And yeah, this was a bit chaotic, but nevertheless, I guess it might have worked. Let's give that a listen. Okay, let's switch off the MIDI click here. So it's a bit out of time, but nevertheless, it was a tough thing to do with that horrible clicky clacky. But nevertheless, now we can edit this pattern and there are not too many options for that. So we have basically only this list editing and I think the pattern needs to be somehow activated. If you click here again, oh, what did I do now? Double click, okay. So let's go away from that. And there, uh, then it activates a pattern as well, so we can choose the grid edit, which is this old school view of the nodes in the event order. And there you can say you want to quantize them. And then they're on the grid here. 
sounds already better. And then let's go on. We can also say we want to cycle between that. Uh, we want to cycle between the two locators. Then it loops here. Then we can move on to the second channel. You see now also it's filled. So it says on. You could also disable or mute the channel. And we could now record some bass. Is that correct? Yeah, here's the bass. Let's try something with a bass. Oh my. Oh, but now we would. Hmm. Not sure if that worked out. So let's give that a little over here. Can always jump to the beginning. Not too bad. <laughs> so we could also go here in the crude edit and also quantize that one. Was it correct? Okay, that was a bit too much of quantization. Nevertheless, you get the idea and then you could go on up to 24 channels. But this is basically what you can do. And then you can go into the arrange option and then arrange the different patterns into a song. But nevertheless, for that time, this was very innovative and you could record whole songs, whole MIDI songs with that. But moving on to Cubase, which was released in April 1989 in its first incarnation version 1. The idea was original to call it Qubit, but there was an issue with that trademark issue, so they had to rename it and the name was then Cubase. And this was the successor then to Pro24, so there's quite some similarities. So the list editor and also the note editor I showed in the previous look at the Pro24 are pretty identical as they were before, but the main new thing is now the Arranger, which you will still find nowadays in basically in all the other doors on the market, including Cubase itself. But let's have a look ourselves. Let's fire up Cubase. I have here version 2 of Cubase, so this is still the MIDI only version. And I'm running this here in the Hattari emulator. And it uses the TOS 1.02 version and the simple plain ST emulation. So one tip, if you want to run old versions, you should always check when this program or this software was released and then match which ST computer was available at this time. So you get an idea which toss you need to make it run successfully. But how do we get MIDI in and out of that? So we can also configure that in the Hattery main menu. And there you can say devices and there you can enable MIDI. And then you choose simply your MIDI input and your output and to the input i connected here my good old fata sl880 keyboard which only sends midi it cannot make any sound and as back then you needed a module or some kind of synthesizer which created sound and the uh, roland gv1080 is really classic soon from that time as well and in contrast to all the current synthesizers or most of the current synthesizers which can only play one sound or maybe two sounds besides some high-end workstations which can still provide a lot of sounds as well. The modules back then could provide many sounds and the GV1080 here can produce different sounds at the same time including a full drum kit so you could create a whole song. So let's check that out. I prepared a little song for you and it's not really a song it's just a, a very very small sketch so let's load that up here. Okay and just have a listen. Nothing too impressive. I just chose the first performance, which is part of the GV1080 and give to some kind of dance, whatever sounds and kits. And as you see, if you go into the menus, you can edit those different sounds. You, for example, can adjust this, the levels of the different sounds and you can also choose the MIDI channel. So this is important. 
the 16 different sounds that the GB module provides can be addressed on those 16 different MIDI channels. But you could also set sounds to the same MIDI channels, which would mean they would play at the same time. With this trick, you could layer sound then to create fuller pads, for example, or layer a string sound of a piano sound and things like that. So, but what I have here is just three tracks. It's a drum a track, a bass track, and this is this little electro thing. And you can mute tracks so for example we could listen to only one sound so let's hear the drums or you could also only monitor the bass In all the modern doors, you have a proper mixer, but back then you had really only MIDI. So what you could do is send MIDI signals to the GB1080, for example, here and change some parameters. And you can go there with a double click here. So you can have these settings for the part of the track or for the arrangement. And there, for example, you can change here the volume. Let's, let's give it a go. For example, you could take the drums down. Or you can make them louder again. But this is a bit clumsy. But nevertheless, you see the basic things are there. You have your tracks of the different MIDI channels. You have the arranger, which you can loop here in a certain region. It's also very fast to use. You simply click with the right mouse button here to set the right locator and you click the left one to set the left locator you can use one and two on your numeric block on the keyboard to go quickly to that location and then start here playback with the enter key so everything could operate it here on the system by just simply using the buttons on the numeric block also with a, with a zero you can jump to the beginning so you can very quickly navigate here in your arrangement but you can now also record something new for example here i have another track with nothing too meaningful on it another kind of effect sound but nevertheless let's give it a go and record that but first let's set the locator correct again and for recording you can simply press the star also on the extension keyboard and it starts recording <laughs> I played a little bit wrong, which was intentional, just so I can show you the editor. So there are different editors available. So I have this note grid. Maybe let's start with that, where you see all the individual note values with their position and do some very detailed editing. And with all editors, you can close them either with cancel or with keep. And this can also be operated nicely on the keyboard. So if you press the escape key, you can discard your changes and with the return, you can accept your changes. So this is really optimized to be operated very fast with the keyboard. And yeah, let's have a look at the other editor. So there's a drum editor, but first let's look at a normal key editor where I just played this little thing. And you see, it's not really on the crit, the first note, and you could simply mark it and press Q. So it's quantizing to 16th out there, but we could say we want to quantize this to the full bar. And if I then press it, it's now located here. But I actually wanted to delete that. So you have, if you click with the right mouse button, you have this very quick access to this menu. And there is a delete icon and you can simply delete the note. But you could also create new notes here with that one. And we want to do that as well. So let's go first to the beginning where we have on bar three this note. But I wanted to have actually the first one here on bar one. And there can draw in also the note on that one and let's make that longer and you can switch to the normal mouse key and you can also quantize that to the full bar and let's give that a listen Okay, why is that not played? Okay, so this is another thing to see. You see also the velocity down there, so you could increase the velocity that was very low here. First, you need to mark the note, and then hopefully, 
Okay, this is a bit weird. Let's move that maybe here. Ah, now we can do it. No, again. Ah, I think, ah, we need that one here. Ah, that was how it works. Right, so we need also to do here, to use a pen. So let's put that back on one. So now it should play as well. Ah, yes, here it is. So we can simply press now the return key to close it down. So let's also have a look at a drum editor. So if we first mark here this little pattern and there you can go here to the drum editor. And there you see also this classic look and here you don't have the pan, you have here the drumstick to set additional drum sounds as well. And there, for example, the clap was missing here in the beginning. So we could add a clap here as well. And I think you can do different velocities. So if, yeah, exactly, I remember. If you press the control key, you can have a higher velocity. And I think if we have it with shift, well, we have the highest velocity, exactly. So let's do it like this. Maybe only on the two and the four. Let's listen to that. Ah, here it was missing. There we miss here a bass drum sound and we miss also a clap. Nice. <laughs> so that's basically what you can do. Besides that, you also have a score editor, which was a new thing. And yeah, maybe it looks a little bit stupid on the drums. So let's maybe switch back maybe to the bass track and have a look here at the score. And there you could also have a look then at what the bass notes are and it also follows the playback, which is also interesting. So also quite nice. And what else do we have? I think the rest are basically some editing functions, so not that much more things. Only one thing I wanted to show you is the phrase synth, which is really interesting thing, the IPS. So this phrase synthesizer was intended to do modulation on MIDI notes. So basically still some ideas you find nowadays, for example, in Bitwig, where you can do also such things. But this was really a complex thing. And if you want to see it, there's an in-depth video that Werner Kracht has on his homepage where he shows it, how it works. And yeah, watch that if you're interested into that tool. And after some time, they removed it from Cubase and some people also created an initiative to bring it back. And he commented on their forums that the reason for removing it, that the management thought it would be a bit too esoteric for the product and to be honest i have to agree yeah and version three of cubase brought lots of lots of um, smaller inventions but one bigger one which was that you could edit whole controllers so you could send midi commands to your synthesizers the price went up to 550 pound by the way and this relates nowadays to 1330 pound and yeah big jump if you compare that to cubase pro 13 which is the current incarnation of cubase which is only 430 euro in comparison to 1500 so Software definitely got much cheaper nowadays. And there was also a specific score version, which is surprising because scoring was also in a normal version, but the only info I could find about it, that it would be more complete, whatever that means. But there was one info about score, which is interesting that it was capable of 128 tracks and the other normal version only of 64. This could also be a reason to buy into the score version. But now let's look into Cubase audio. And this was really difficult to understand what versions were released and what you needed and very difficult to find out. And I hope I got it right. If not, please correct me down in the comments again. But let's give this a shot. So 
the first Cubase audio was actually not on an Atari ST, as I said in the last video. So another correction, the first version was on the Macintosh, but for that you had to have a digital design system for the audio part. So it was not able to run only on a Macintosh or record only audio on the Macintosh without the digital design system, which was also very, very expensive. So, but back to the Atari ST, so the second incarnation was actually then developed for the ST and the, there were two things. The first one was also bundled with hardware, which I showed in the last video already, the CBXD5 from Yamaha was required. And the good thing about that was that you could run it on all of the Atari ST models if they had at least two megabyte of memory. So this is then interesting if you have one of the older and cheaper models. But then there was a Falcon version which only required the Falcon to be run on and nothing else. So this is the first implementation of an audio engine which required only a computer and nothing else. And this was then also the basis for putting this solution on the PC later on. And as Werner Gracht also mentioned on his homepage is that all these specific hardware versions which required for example the Yamaha or the DigiDesign system were basically <laughs> financial disasters for Steinberg and the first time they started making money that was when they had their own pure audio engine which did not require specific hardware. And this gets clearer if you take a look at the setup you needed to do, for example, with the CBX, you needed to have the MIDI input and outputs connection, but then you also needed a, a SCSI port. And if you did not have the SCSI port, that's why I mentioned before that the, S, the Mega SCE, which had then SCSI on board, which could then directly be connected to a SCSI hard disk and then a CBX. But if you did not have that, you needed this converter which is also a clunky and expensive thing and the simpler setup is clearly if you have already a SCSI port on board but nevertheless it's complicated and if you had to deal in the past with SCSI it's a nightmare protocol for to get going you always had to check these terminators and these things but that's not the end of the story. There's also another version. There is Cubase Audio 16, which then featured 16 tracks instead of only eight on the Falcon version. And these were compressed, but I could not fully find out if this was a lossless compression or not. I somehow read between the lines that it could be lossy, but if you know more about that, just tell me down in the comments. I would be interested in that as well. And there was also quite some hardware available from Steinberg, but was actually built by a German company called Soundpool. And from them, you could get this interface, the FDI for digital inputs and outputs, but also an analog interface, which featured eight analog outputs as well and you could get them also from the company itself and they had then this green look and feel and they had also a nice MIDI interface with four outputs. Whoa, this got again an insanely long <laughs> video and it took me again lots of research and reading. And I hope you liked this video and enjoyed watching all that information and tell me again what I missed and did wrong. I'm looking forward to that. And until next time with the Falcon or whatever computer makes me think